This is Lecture Outline 10, pages 8 through 12, the third video in the series. We're going to start with now exceptions to the octet rule, and what we will see is as much as the octet rule rules, uh, there are some exceptions. And there's a couple of exceptions I just want to go over very quickly, and these pertain to the periodic table. If you look at beryllium's position, it's near the very close to the top of the periodic table. And all we're going to say for now is that beryllium with, uh, likes to have four valence electrons instead of eight, and typically with two bonds. Boron, the next element on the periodic table, likes to have uh, six valence electrons. with three bonds. And uh, these are going to be cases that I'm going to put in parentheses because you are not expected to know that these are exceptions. But in future lectures, we will do examples because they are some simple examples and some really nice examples using these two facts. So I just want you to be aware of them. You don't have to really memorize them. Third, odd numbers of valence electrons. You may have noticed that everything we've done so far has an even number of valence electrons, and those are the vast majority of cases of interest. Every once in a while, you'll stumble across something that has an odd number of valence electrons, and the first thing I'll say is recount your electrons to make sure it's odd, because uh, I've made enough counting mistakes to, to know that usually they are even. And the only time you'll see odd numbers of valence electrons in this class is if it says this, these species have odd number of valence electrons. Anyway, if there's odd, odd numbers of valence electrons, then you still cannot go over the octet rule. So instead of having nine, you would have seven. So do not exceed. eight valence electrons. And so a good example is nitrogen monoxide. We have five plus six, that's 11. And nitrogen monoxide exists, uh, even though according to Lewis structures with their even numbers of valence electrons, we would not necessarily predict this. And I'll just say a couple words. Lewis structures are very good at predicting structures, but they're not perfect and they are a very convenient way to do the vast majority, uh, show the vast majority of bonding and covalent bonding in molecules. It's not a perfect system. It is a simple, powerful system. But if we were to do this, we would end up with, let's see, let's do it up here. Connect with single bonds, sprinkle your electrons around. So I have two, four, six, eight, uh, 10, 11, then form a double bond there. And we end up with uh, nit uh, oxygen with two, four, six, eight, an octet. Nitrogen with one, two, uh, sorry, two, four, six, seven. And when we do a formal charge analysis, you'll see why I chose to put the single electron on nitrogen. Oxygen has two bonds and two lone pairs. It has zero formal charge. Nitrogen has one, two, three, four, five, and it has five electrons from the periodic table. So this Lewis structure, if we do a formal charge analysis, is the best choice. And then the other thing is with odd numbers of valence electrons, do not exceed eight. Do not make a triple bond there. Okay. So the next thing is, and this is something that you do have to know, phosphorus, sulfur, and all of the 3P area elements, meaning 3P area of the periodic table, that's gonna be right here, 3P, and all of the elements below them, but not the 2P area. Um, and I think what we wanna say is on the next slide, um, the same thing, and I apologize for that. So all the elements with higher atomic numbers, 
these elements can have expanded octets to minimize formal charge. To minimize formal charge. And sulfate is, the, uh, is a really good example of this, although many polyatomic ions will fall under this category. All right, so sulfate, 6 plus 4 times 6 plus 2. Uh, add this up, we get 32 valence electrons for our Lewis structure. Sulfur goes in the middle. And again, all I'm doing is I'm stepping through the uh, steps for the, the Lewis structure. Then we're going to do a formal charge analysis. Uh, sulfur goes in the middle, surrounded by the oxygens. About the only time you have more than one central atom is if carbon's in the molecule. And we'll talk about that more. I have two, four, six, eight electrons. Now let's go ahead and do 10, 12, 14. The oxygen there has an octet. 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, 32. And so we have all of our electrons in there. And so and everybody has an octet. So we are finished with the first portion, with the, the uh, initial set of rules. Now we do a formal charge analysis. When we do a formal charge analysis, we would see that on the oxygen, uh, formal charge on oxygen. So there are six valence electrons from the periodic table. There is one bond and one, two, three, four, five, six unshared electrons. And we get minus one for the formal charge on this oxygen. And since all the oxygens are identical, meaning one bond and six electrons, each of those oxygens has a minus formal charge. Well, there's only minus two uh, overall charge on this, so we're not surprised when we do the formal charge on sulfur. Six valence electrons from the periodic table, four bonds, zero unshared electrons. We get plus two. That is an awful lot of formal charge. Now we minimize the formal charge. To do that, we do have to use this thing called an expanded octet. What is an expanded octet? It is more electrons than eight. Could be 10. In this case, it will be 12. I've seen as high as 14. Choose any two oxygens. Move over a pair of electrons that takes down the formal charge, or takes from minus one to zero for the oxygen. And we are left with, for the sulfur, as we will see, uh, we will see that the formal charge on sulfur is zero as well. Let me put in all my electrons. So many electrons. That looks good. Still have a negative formal charge on two of the oxygens, and um, but now that is the minimum amount of formal charge. It is on the it, they are on the oxygens, so uh, and that is an oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur. The next question about expanded octets is if you look at this sulfur, there are now two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve electrons, and where does it put those extra electrons? And we don't want to say too much about this other than to say, here's sulfur on the periodic table. Sulfur is in the 3P area. In N equals 3, there is also the 3D sublevel.
in which to place uh, electrons for the expanded octet. In which to place expanded octet electrons. And it's not quite as simple as that, but that's how simple we're going to keep it. And that uh, uh, actually explains why if you're in the 3p area, there's 3d, so you can have an expanded octet. 4p, 5p, 6p have the corresponding d sublevels. But 2p, there is no 2d sublevel, and so boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, neon, they cannot have expanded octets. Only from the 3p area down and sulfur, fluorine, phosphorus, those are the uh, most common examples of expanded octets, though we will see other ones farther down in the periodic table. And it's important that you know that farther down can do it as well to minimize formal charge. Okay, so now we know about expanded octets. Uh, next topic is resonance structures. And we'll tell you uh, how to do them, and then we'll tell you uh, what this means, the true representation of the bonding. Resonance structures have the same layout of atoms. Always keep the atoms on the same places on the page, but different layout of electrons. A true representation of the bonding cannot be drawn with a single Lewis structure. So let me show you what I mean for carbonate, our main example for this entire lecture outline. If you remember, there's a carbon-oxygen double bond and two carbon-oxygen single bonds. Lewis structures always show all of the electrons, so let me draw all of the electrons in, and formal charges. Good. Now, what resonance structures say is that when you have a choice of where you put the double bond here, could have been here, is here, could have been in the other two places, draw all possibilities. So choice for double bond, question mark, draw all possibilities. And you don't have to do these. These are what are called resonance arrows, single a line with an arrowhead on each side. But now leave the atoms where they are and move the double bond. Contin these are Lewis structures, so always draw in all the electrons. Last resonance structure is going to have the double bond down here. Oh, I forgot to do my formal charge. I'll go back and pick that up too. So we have minus, we have minus, we have minus, and we have minus. So there are three resonance structures. And what we want to do is, so now, what are, why are we doing this? What does this mean? Well, if we look at the same two atoms in all three resonance structures, we will see that in total there are two, three, four bonds in three resonance structures. And we're coming back to the true representation of the bonding here. The true representation of the bonding is the average over all resonance structures.
meaning that this bond between carbon and oxygen that I've circled is not a single bond. It is not a double bond. It is what's called a four-thirds bond. And what do we mean by that? Well, we mean that if we were to look at the length of the bond, there is a trend that single bonds are longer than double bonds. which are longer than triple bonds. But we'll leave that out. If we then look at the bond length for carbon-oxygen here, the carbon-oxygen bond length would be somewhere between the bond length for a single and the bond length for a double bond. In fact, that's where we're gonna call this a four-thirds bond. And another word we'll use is that the BO or bond order is four-thirds, okay? Now, if we were to do the same thing for the carbon-oxygen bond here, we'd have one, two, three, four bonds. This is also a four-thirds bond. One, two, three, four. This is also a four-thirds bond. So all three of these carbon-oxygen bonds are four-thirds bonds and all three are identical. So the true representation of the bonding is the average over all resonance structures in carbonate. The carbon-oxygen bonds, or all three carbon-oxygen bonds are four-thirds bonds. All three carbon-oxygen bonds are four-thirds bonds, meaning that they would be shorter than a single bond, longer than a double bond. So let's see, single bond, four-thirds bond, double bond in length. And the bond order would be four-thirds, whereas the bond order for a single bond would be one, and the bond order for a double bond would be two, as we'll discuss in future videos. We're gonna do a bunch of examples of resonance structures as well. For now, let's move on to polar and nonpolar covalent bonds. A polar bond is going to be, and these again are both types of covalent bonds. A polar bond is a covalent bond in which the electrons are shared unequal, or the bonding electrons are shared unequally. And more associated with the more electronegative atom. So trends in electronegativity will be important. Simplest example, HF. If we were to draw its Lewis structure, there would be three pairs of electrons plus the bond around the fluorine for its octet, and we are now complete. Now if we look at our periodic table, we know that fluorine is the most electronegative element. As you go to the left and down, you, electronegativity decreases. Hydrogen's way up here. And so I guess the thing to know about hydrogen as far as nonmetals is that hydrogen is the least electronegative nonmetal. Fluorine is the most electronegative element. So fluorine definitely, more electronegative than everything, definitely than hydrogen. 
So uh, what that means is these two bonding electrons are more associated with the fluorine than the hydrogen. Because of that, these two bonding electrons being more closely associated with fluorine, the fluorine is going to be uh, have a partial negative charge. And the hydrogen is going to have a partial positive charge. And this is going to be huge in the remainder of the course. So we'll have a couple ways to denote that, usually on Lewis structures. One is going to be what's called uh, the lowercase Greek letter delta. We're going to put a delta minus. And delta, I'll draw a big version of it, at least how I draw it. It's like a little squiggly D. There's the little D base part. However you draw it, there's other ways to do it too. But uh, partial negative, partial positive. Another way of doing it is what's called with a plus arrow. For a plus arrow, there's a plus next to the atom that is partially positive, and the arrow shows the electrons more associated with the fluorine, so plus arrow. And so the electrons are being pulled towards the fluorine. And either of these, partial positive, partial negative, plus arrow, writing it out, this is a partial permanent separation of charge called a dipole. And in fact, that's the definition of a dipole, D-I-P-O-L-E, is a partial, permanent, a permanent partial separation of charge. within a molecule. Okay. Uh, dipoles are going to be very important. Um, and so this plus arrow is a representation of a dipole. This partial positive and partial negative is another representation of a dipole. When we get to larger molecules than this one that just has one bond, we'll probably pick the plus arrows because there's, so this is two parts to draw a dipole, this is just one, but either way works for me. Nonpolar bond, also a covalent bond, in which the elect bonding electrons are shared equally. And the easiest way to do that is with two atoms that are the same. Like two fluorines. So this would be a non-polar covalent bond. The electronegativities are the same. That means that these two bonding electrons are being pulled towards each of them equally. And therefore there is no dipole. And bonding is a continuum. And we're going to put uh, bonding in terms of, on the bottom, difference in electronegativity. Delta EN is difference in electronegativity. And we'll start at zero. And we'll go um, all the way up. I mean, um, and then in the middle here, we'll put 2.0. 2.0 is generally considered the dividing line. So on this side, these are going to be ionic bonds. So this is a simplified picture of things. On less than 2.0, as a difference in electronegativity are going to be covalent bonds. 
and zero exactly would be nonpolar. And anything above zero, so uh, all the way up to 1.9 would be polar. And what we'll see is that there's more separation of charge in general when there's a larger difference in electronegativity.